regarding those folks that were held up by, Mr. Tuber, by Senator Tuberville and the fact that they didn't complain. Well, good for them, because when we wear the uniform, yours is not to question why, yours is just to do and die. And we don't talk about political things because it is against the regulation. So they weren't doing anything grandiose. They were doing their duty as they should. And Tuberville was doing his duty as he should. The policies in the military regarding the subject at hand are wrong. And thank God somebody was willing to fight for them. I just want to point out to what my colleague just said. As, you know, as it relates to members of the United States military whose promotions were being held up because of a senator who had problems from an ideological point of view with bodily autonomy, the message to them was, ours is not to reason why, but to do or die. But then to a gentleman here who did complain and fight, wrote, wrote a book about his issues, the message was completely different, which I just shows, I think shows the hypocrisy in this room right now from the other side of the aisle. The fact of the matter is that Chairman Comer has a history of selective treatment of the facts presented to him um, that would really make any witness concerned about any kind of closed door procedure or deposition. My amendment outlines how the chairman has misrepresented the mountain of bank records that show no wrongdoing. The fact that Chairman Comer has only released two of the 17, two of the 17 witness transcripts so far, we want him to release the transcripts. And we also know that the chairman has interviewed some of Hunter Biden's associates. And it seems that to the rest of America, that and no dirt could be found and because of that they wanted to bury the truth but the truth is out because the truth is that this has been a complete waste of time to my colleagues on the other side of the aisle let's be honest with immigrants who deserve better than what you're offering them don't welcome immigrants if you plan to reject them if you keep pushing your bigoted hr2 bill then also pass this bill i've taken the liberty of drafting it for you it removes the Statue of Liberty, our largest symbol that tells people to come here. This is who you are, removing the fabric of America. So I want to know which Republican who supports and voted for H.R. 2 will introduce this bill. If you're going to support H.R. 2 and these bigoted measures, the least you can do is not be a damn liar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So since Republican politicians have no plan to address the real issues of this country, low wages, high prices, et cetera, their leaders at the highest levels have dipped into the fascist playbook to blame communities and to blame minorities and to blame immigrants for the issues that Americans are facing. And these days, the more fear you can stoke, the better. I mean, one of my colleagues, Marjorie Taylor Greene, has called immigrants terrorists. Uh, and many on the right take their uh, cues from their top leader, former President Donald Trump. From 2015 to just this past Monday night in Iowa, he has used fear and racism to spread false narratives. He said that immigrants are, quote, poisoning the blood of our country, end quote, echoing the same language used by Hitler to describe Jewish people. Mr. Beer, why is it grossly incorrect to paint immigrants as criminals, and why is this rhetoric not only false, but dangerous? Look, U.S. Census Bureau data is quite clear. Uh, immigrants are about half as likely to be incarcerated in the United States as others. Uh, if you look at the illegal immigrant population as, as we have at the Cato Institute, it's, uh, it, again, it's about 30% less. And that includes all the people that we're putting in, in, in cages just because they're immigrants. So it's, it's not true that they're more likely to uh, end up in our criminal justice system, burdening our courts and our police. Um, and, and also, if you look at area studies that look at what happens to crime rates when uh, an infusion of immigrants comes in, We've seen during the 1990s, especially when you had this huge wave, far exceeding anything that's happened recently, uh, of immigrants come into major cities, they, there was this rebirth in the economy in those areas. They mm -hmm. started businesses, they rejuvenated the communities, filled vacant housing, and that brought crime rates down as well. So there yeah. are multiple mechanisms by which immigrants reduce crime and, in and make for a more secure community. Of course, thank you. Mr. Beer, are you familiar with stochastic terrorism? Stochastic terrorism is to provoke random acts of ideological motivated violence that are statistically predictable. 
Last year, a gunman murdered 23 people and injured another 22 in El Paso, Texas, using the same rhetoric of invasion and the great replacement theory that we hear from Donald Trump and many leaders on the right. Mr. Beer, what's the point of stoking this type of hate towards immigrants? Look, there's, there's only two reasons why you use the word invasion. The first is you want to justify violence against them. Otherwise, you'd say it's a violation of the law, it's illegal, you, you want a law enforcement response. Uh, invasion calls for a military violent response to these people. The second reason is to uh, invoke invasion under the constitutional clauses in which that is used. There's two. One, states can respond to an invasion unilaterally. Um, we know what an invasion under the Constitution means. James Madison said an invasion is an act of war. So we know what an, a real invasion is. We know the difference between mm -hmm. people coming to serve us and so, work for us versus a, an act of war. So this language fuels a lot of these hate, hateful, violent acts we've seen. Oh, absolutely. So I just hosted a round table in my district because my constituents are terrified about the talk that's going on up here. An amazing community leader and pastor, Father Jose, brought up a really good point that migrants don't just want to come here. We told them to come here. And Mr. Beer, the Statue of Liberty, situated next to Ellis Island, uh, an, an iconic American symbol, reads, Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempted toss to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. As Americans, we must reject hypocrisy and lead with love. And as long as Republican officials are more interested in peddling hate, the solutions and uh, to fixing this problem in our immigration system will only get worse. Thank you, I yield back. Frost is recognized for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm offering an amendment to this misguided resolution that would essentially work to take out the lies and the smoke and mirrors and insert the truth of the matter before us. My amendment outlines how last month, Chairman Comer uh, tried to push this fake impeachment by selectively, selectively talking about a truck that President Biden initially made payments on while he was still a private citizen that his son, Hunter Biden, later, later paid him back for. The month before, Chairman Comer selectively released just a one-page of a four-page email chain to falsely claim that regulators were concerned that Hunter Biden was money laundering when that wasn't true. What the chairman selectively forgot to share is that the other three pages of the email directly contradicted his claims. Regulators explicitly stated that the transactions were reasonably and consistent with the business profile, and that's a quote, and that the entity was transparent. And it doesn't stop there. Republican, cl Republican claims all throughout this case barely hold up to the slightest bit of scrutiny. And it's not just me saying that. We've heard it on Fox News. We've heard it from the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, CNN, and others who have been investigating uh, the chairman's false claims of evidence against President Biden. And once again, it's been said time and time again, Hunter Biden, took us up on the offer of sitting in that chair in this committee and publicly uh, uh, answering questions so that way the public can see it and so that way he doesn't have his words misrepresented in a closed door deposition. And what this works to do is give the entire story. If you're gonna vote to hold him, him in contempt, at least, at least vote yes on this amendment so we can include the full story in this piece of legislation. It is the fear of the truth that has stopped the chairman from accepting Hunter Biden's offer to testify publicly, and my amendment um, essentially lays it all out on the table. I urge adoption of my amendment, and then let's move on and do the real work of the American people, especially in these difficult times. I yield back. I'm from the state of Florida. Um, this war on wokeism is not new to me, um, and it's a shame that Republicans on this committee haven't caught on to my governor, DeSantis' failing presidential campaign that's based on this war on woke, and this misplacement on wokeism in the military endangers America's national security by ignoring the real threats. Some of the real threats to our national security are low military recruitment and retention rates, which is what I wanna focus on today. Look, service members aren't leaving the military because of DEI training, or because a military base was renamed, or because someone accessed an abortion. 
But what I do hear from my constituents is this. I've had folks write about problems with housing allowance being too low in the military. People messaging me about saying medications are too expensive. Um, folks worrying that service members won't be able to get pay if Republicans in Congress shut down the government. These are the real things that resonate with American, the American people because these are the issues that this committee needs to be addressing. Uh, General, you testified that the Army became more diverse and welcoming to soldiers of color over your time in service. How has that inclusion helped retain talented service members? We have a greater, thank you, Congressman, we have a, a, a greater pool to draw from. We didn't used to be able to draw from people of color or women or if we had LGBTQ, they were kicked out, of which I know many that were kicked out. We have a broader thing. We need every person to be able to serve. And we can't do that if we are trying to kick people out or not allowing people to serve and not make it welcoming. We're a better army because of our diversity. I 100% agree, agree with you. I mean, we know uh, at West Point that black students had highlighted at, during their time the art memorializing the traitor Confederate general uh, Robert E. Lee that hung on the wall and the fact that the only black person hanging on the walls was someone who was a slave. And I think that things like that hurt our military readiness and national security when it makes our service members uncomfortable. Um, diversity, equity, inclusion strengthens our national military. It does not work against it. General, you've also testified about your own story of service. Uh, quote, I didn't choose the army uh, because of patriotism. I signed up for the money, end quote. And I don't bring that up as a disparaging thing because we know that this is something that is true for many of our service members. Um, and especially when I speak with folks who look like myself in my community um, that are looking at joining the military. You joined um, to help afford college, your college, and ended up staying for more than four decades. So thank you so much for your service. We know that many soldiers enlist for financial reasons, but then choose not to re-enlist because it's unaffordable for them. Um, have you observed any trends around how economic struggles can stunt a soldier's career? Uh, thank you, Congressman. Yes, I particularly think that's true because the, our soldiers now deploy or actually rotate so often to Eastern Europe, to South Korea, uh, and to the Middle East uh, without additional money for that. And so if you're doing two nine-month rotations to one of those two places, plus National Training Center or other things, it's incredible uh, dif difficult, particularly for the family at home, because they have no great child care options. Yeah, yeah, and um, I, I would love to host a hearing about that instead um, to see how we can handle those struggles.